Does anybody know what it would mean? What it means is if you're an economist and you think it's not worth doing anything about this because the costs outweigh the benefits, well, that's how Venus got into trouble. The Venus, the economists just let the CO2 keep from being emitted. Now you have a planet that's about 400 degrees centigrade because the economists there didn't price carbon properly. Uh, if you don't like that one. I'm trying it out. It's new. It's new. The only problem is that we do have quite a few economists in this college who we do like. Well, but are they members of the Venus School? Or I don't know. We can ask. <laughs> yeah. Well, I heard, I got fed up with this one guy. It isn't worth doing. He quoted something from the IPCC. And I thought to myself, well, what's the response to this? And I thought, and I thought, and I thought, the implication of what he's saying is we will do nothing. We will let the Earth warm up as high as it will go based on the amount of available carbon in the ground as long as it's cost competitive. That's what he was saying. Hmm. So he's a member of the Venus School. Question there, yeah. over here, Hugh. Oh, oh I've got one over here, then, then back over there. Yeah. If what? If the Arctic yeah. Oh. You were talking about irreversibility earlier today. Yeah. Well, parts of it won't ever come back in for a long You know, I don't really know the answer. If we do what Hugh has suggested, if we intervene... In geo, with, a, with a solar radiation management scheme, the ice comes back. Depends how deeply you do it. The ice comes back, which cools things off, which brings back, helps to bring back glaciers. So when people say, oh, all well, this will never happen, they generally have not modeled a geoengineering intervention because in theory, this is pretty radical stuff, but you could lower the temperature of the Earth by two degrees, you can lower it back to pre-industrial levels. Well, that would change things radically. So I think there's so many people who say is, this and that is irreversible, but they don't model this element where you would actually cool the planet down. Because if you, if you don't remove the CO2, the planet stays, stays hot for centuries. And then the inertial is, issues of inertia take over. So, but this, yep. is where, this is where the overshoot comes in. Imagine, yes. imagine we uh, can get to 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees by 2100. Yeah. But if we don't do geoengineering, we have a 1.5 degree overshoot. Well, then, let's say we get to 1.5 degrees. And sea then, level riot will rise for centuries because the ocean has to warm yeah, up yeah, that's true. To, to meet that. And the glaciers have to melt mm. to meet that. And it takes a long time to get the atmosphere to equilibrate with the change. It's, there's a transient effect in the short run, but, but because think, you have to heat, sorry. But I, think, but I think the answer to this question, though, is that once we lose sea ice yeah. in the summer in the Arctic, yeah. it's going to be pretty hard to get it back. No, you have to look at to the models. Do not answer that question until you have the right kind of modeling. And the right kind of model, integrated modeling with sea ice, ice sheets, Oceans and atmosphere basically is in a primitive stage. Mm -hmm. You go out here to the British Antarctic Survey or whoever you've got here in the climate people and ask them if they have a model that will do this. I don't okay. think they do. I mean, I talk to people at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, which has the best modeling on the geoengineering front, and I don't think they're there yet based on what they tell me. Right. So I'm just saying, I'm asserting we're not there yet. Okay. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Well, question, yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Tom, thanks very much. Uh, I, I, I guess I'm sort of on the same lines as the consumption of the question that was asked there. Um, and you were touching on the thought that uh, us humans as a group have got to face up the fact that yeah. we're changing the world. We can't just take it for granted. We, we, it's in our custody now. We've really got to work right. with it. Right. Right. And I mean, I, I actually resonate with that. And it's a sort of political and ethical and just a way of thinking that we absolutely aren't, seriously aren't used to. So we need to put in work, sort of building up right. the sense of what that right. like to right. be responsible for it. 
Right. But it seems to me the one aspect of it is, is individuals sort of stepping up to the plate, as well as businesses and governments and the whole movement stepping up to the plate. And I mean, I just wonder whether that strikes you as important too. Uh, the, 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 some head of an environmental group was recently given a lot of flack for jetting around the world. For what? For, was given a lot of stick. Yeah. Because he did a lot of flying. Oh. And it wasn't at all clear that it was really necessary for his job. Right. And I'm sort of wondering whether individual people say, I take this thing to be serious enough that I personally have cut some of my meat consumption. Or that I personally am not flying, though I fly for business or whatever, I don't fly for pleasure as much as I used to and so on. Mm -hmm. so does, I mean, it seems to me that unless an individual lets the, the structure of the situation impact right through what his or her own choices, his or her own minuscule uh, contribution to driving this enormous thing that's doing the damage to the planet, we somehow haven't, haven't yet stepped up to the draft mm. provision that you're, mm -hmm. you're offering us of us being right. responsible. So what can we do as individuals? Well, in the world of a decarbonized economy, everybody uses less. I mean, there are two pieces. I mean, one piece is to cut demand, and the other is to change fuel source. So individuals, I think it's a great point. So you can walk around, you know, worrying about <laughs> turning on the hot water. You can get pretty obsessive about this. And, uh, but it's worth paying attention to all these elements, and that begins the process of change, right? So that an individual is doing this and might say, oh, well, uh, this is not enough. The response is not only on an individual basis, but on a societal basis. Because the action of a portion of society doesn't work. It's a collective problem. That's why we have government. That's why we have government. But government has to function. Yeah, if it doesn't function, we lose. Mm. We suffer. Did you have a question, Natalie? Oh, absolutely. Policies at the core of it. And policies are the work of government. So if you're not, you have to advocate or become a part of government to put the policies in place to make this work. You can't solve the problem by your own habit. You can contribute to it. You have your, makes you more committed. You can urge others to become part of the solution. At least to get out and vote. Yeah, well, yeah, but you can, I think it helps to look at your own energy use, your own uh, uh, diet, all the pieces, and try to become conscious of what's going on. At the same time, you can function in government. You can, you can do both things. Doesn't have to be one. Uh, right up the back, yeah. I think there's, there are different forms of denialism. 
One is that there are people who would deny it because they don't want to suffer the consequences of the transition, whether they're a company or a miners' union or something. We have to be responsive, particularly to the miners, but there's an ideological component, of, but probably much bigger, where people just say it's fake news. I don't believe it. it doesn't exist. You know, they just will not. They have blocked on this one. So there's that. That's the disease component. There's kind, you know. BP spent $13 million in Washington State on a referendum that happened last Tuesday to defeat a carbon tax referendum. That was BP. I imagine it has something to do with their refineries in Washington State or what have you. That was not because they don't believe in the problem. That was their self-interest. So, you know, our majority leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, who say, Obama was leading a war on coal because he wanted to be, appear to be representing the miners of eastern Kentucky that he comes from, because that's a coal mining region. Well, there are a lot of reasons that make up his statement, but there is the problem that in certain states, the United States, they're highly energy intensive, particularly coal intensive. So there's sort of a regional economy issue. So that's different as well. So I, I think the multiple causes. So, we've got one at the back there, yeah? Yes, first of all, what would you think of the idea of the moral hazard at temperature engineering? That by knowing we have an emergency exit, it actually takes the pressure off the other Right. Second, I was wondering if you could put a paradox to stratospheric aerosol injection in terms of research, insofar as you can't know exactly what the impact will be in the atmosphere until you do it at scale globally, and once you do it at scale globally, it's no longer research, it's deployment. And thirdly, just to comment, I think it's worthwhile really being careful the language of geoengineering, because there's a huge difference in terms of risk profile between negative emissions, carbon removal, and between stratosphere and aerosol injection, solar radiation management. And also, I don't think it's, there's not too many reasons to be super down on negative emissions. I mean, at this stage, at least in terms of direct air capture, we can actually see a cost curve which is similar to solar. Okay, I think your was your first point moral, moral hazard. hazard. Yeah, moral hazard, research paradox. Well, uh, you'll have to remind me as I go through this, okay? <laughs> Thank you. On the moral hazard front, two things. That's the point of my uh, argument about simultaneity. You have to move all the things. The argument about the moral hazard, well, if we think about geoengineering, we won't think about decarbonization. I think we have to think, we have to work on all of them, including carbon removal at the same time. Why? Because we're so far committed to massive warming. Okay? So the other side of the moral hazard is not doing it, not implementing it. I'm not sure that's a question of a moral hazard, but some people say, well, we shouldn't do, uh, do solar radiation management because of the risk. Well, what about the risk of not doing it? It's a risk on risk situation. What was the second thing? Second was the idea of a research paradox when it comes to stratospheric aerosol. You have to do it at full scale. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what Penatubo does. It's a great experiment. It's a natural experiment. And it all falls out of the atmosphere in a year or two. So if we go experiment, we put Hughes' solution up in the stratosphere for a year, we'll find out whether it works. Not a big risk. Really. Not a well, big risk. Well, I'm not, I don't think that's right. I don't think it's right because... Um, what? I'm wrong? Go ahead. <laughs> well, there's two types of yeah. stuff you can put up there. There's stuff that you put up there where you have to do the whole banana or nothing at all. That's like Pinatubo. It took two weeks before that stuff that Pinatubo 
Yeah. It took two weeks for it to... Right. to, to, to but it, there are other stuff you can do in small locations to test. Yeah, I it's understand. Like, well, you, you're worried about this. I don't worry about it. Go for the whole banana. Okay. On the, uh, because I don't, if, as long as the lifetime of the aerosol is short, okay, like a year, not that much can happen. You understand? We have been doing, uh, we have been doing solar radiation management for decades through air pollution. Yeah, uh, but that's so different. It's a tropospheric it's, aerosol. It's different. Why? It's different because we've been doing it not on purpose. We've been doing it because we wanted energy. And we didn't know that we were doing it. And now we discover we're doing it. Yeah, but and we're addicted we're, to this energy. We're not going to stop doing it. Uh, well, you're, not, you're wrong. The, okay. Uh, I know I'm wrong, but I can say it. And the other <laughs> thing that I'm going to say yeah. is that if you put in an infrastructure that will deliver this stuff up into the stratosphere, yeah. and it's cost you however many trillions to get it going, you're not going to try it for a year and switch it off. You're going to say, oh, we're, we've, well, we've spent back. all this money. No, no, no. We're in a new world. We have to manage this planet. You have to think about these things differently. This is what we have to do. We don't have a choice. Do it, use it, or lose it, uh, so to speak. Right. You know, We're going to just have to take a few chances here. I'm not worried about that one. What I was trying to say about tropospheric aerosols, i.e. air pollution, that was cooling the earth for decades. Decades. Mm. Now, what was yeah. the third point? Oh, the third point was saying being careful about language between negative emissions and geoengineering. It's a very, very different yeah. profile. I don't consider carbon removal geoengineering. Is I that think what that's you're true. saying? What? I think that's changing. I, I think that's changing. I think the word geoengineering is increasingly being, being applied to stratospheric. Some aerosol. people do. I don't buy it. So I, when I say geoengineering, I mean... Solar radiation management. Yeah, that's Reflectivity. Okay, let's move on. We've got another question over there. Yeah. Um, can you talk, hopefully, I'm not in economics. You what? I know very little about, I know very little about economics. Sorry. Well, that makes two of us. Okay. Hopefully, you're supposed to focus on these amazing community economics. You talked about Venus economists who are so far ignoring the problem that they're not sure. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, these models that the IPCC used to get us to 1.5 degrees have an implied carbon price in them. That the model says, if you put a carbon price on the emissions or the fuel of X number of pounds per ton, emissions will fall, concentrations will stabilize over time. It's based on a model of, uh, of the sensitivity of coal, for example, to a higher price. You put the, raise the price of coal, how much more nuclear or gas or solar or wind will come online. The higher the price of coal, the faster the transition. So that's how the models work. You simply price your way out of the problem. That will raise the price of electricity but it will diminish the carbon emissions. Does this have to be a globally agreed process? No, or? no, no, no. Do it like Paris. Everybody comes up with their own tax. And then you work toward harmonization. The worst thing to do is to wait for a global agreement on the tax. So that's what, that, what, that's what went wrong at Copenhagen and Kyoto? No, no. There was no proposal for a global tax. Kyoto's problem was that it was a legally binding cap and in the United States, it required uh, advice and consent of the Senate, which was not there. The votes were not there. And implementing legislation to hit the cap and the political will to do what was necessary. So as a Kyoto negotiator, we were way out in front of the po politics of our government, yeah. of Congress. So we're going to be, let's just say we've got another, say, five minutes of questions. And then we'll hang around and you can talk to Rafe. So, another couple of questions. Yeah, question here. So you, you're feeling we need to understand one another more in 
relation to planets and the mark that we need to study this sort of thing. I've got a sort of um, different angle which results from what you've said. Um, you've politely not mentioned Mr. Trump, but I realize it's taken as a red. I think the fact that he comes up unexpectedly from reality TV to take over and ruin the democratic tradition exactly at the stage when the opposite should be happening, given the advantages of the previous president, whatever he thinks of him, as having initiated or developed some of the advantages. So I think it's an extraordinary pathological, important analysis to see what's happened. That in the context of the Republican Party, whatever one thinks of the tradition, yeah. that here are the people for tradition, here are the people you say who are interested in research, and they are the people who have single-handedly foisted on a liberal tradition. It's very antithesis at a time when it was urgently needed. And there's something almost paranoid, um, psychotic, or whatever, where ridiculous possible worlds have been made, one has been chosen as the actual world, and then read out as if it's a description of the world. So, I'm going on a bit, but if I could just get you mm -hmm. in. It's wonderful what you hear, because one of the now deceased fellows of Trinity, who was not interested, it seemed, in natural language, in communication in a normal way, Casimir Louis, used to bang on with an abstract lesson, and it was this. Just because you know doesn't entail that you understand. He said, knowing is not a recognition capacity. And it seems to me... Not a what? Not a recognition capacity. Just because you know it, you assume you're familiar or you understand it. Now, it seems to me that his point has come to applied empirical fruition. That is, how on earth did it happen with Mr. Trump? Um, not very interested, apart from the fact that he's a prime actor in destroying the magnitude of the success of the planet. And he's not done it in some remote, odd area of Russia or North Korea. He's taken Washington, and it seems extraordinary to me. So can I just round off with mm -hmm. my point? Let's take the analogy of evolution. He's taken evolution, he's taken the media technology, he's rehearsed very well, he's taken his developing technology, and actually ruthlessly using it to kill evolution and change its direction. So I really seriously think that this man, and I don't mean in a nasty way, but analytically and publicly, needs relentlessly parroting, targeting, and serious description, description and communication as the epitome of someone who seems to communicate but is devilishly and we could use evolution, he's turned evolution around. He's used forward moving technology together with people like Murdoch and gather them all and relentlessly driving us into the destruction of the past. So, so do you think do you think that do you think Trump can uh, in in the in the time that he's got, whether it's four years or eight years, can he have if we look back on this in fifty years' time, do we say that Trump was the turning point or is that um, well, yes and no. I mean, pardon? Well, if when Trump leaves office, behind him will be this massive, massive, very large number of people in the United States who are denialists. There will be successors to Trump, his anti-science denialist. But there were, quite a few, there were quite a few around before Trump. But That's more what I'm now? saying. He, but he is the fulfillment of that in a certain way. Of, I mean, he didn't withdraw from Paris. He withdrew from the Paris Agreement because a large portion of his base, his infrastructure of people, wanted him to do that. That was their position. I don't think that Trump cared one way or the other. He doesn't care. Mm. He just does what seems to work for him. That's what they wanted. So uh, one last uh, question then, I think, and then we'll wind it up. Okay, yep, one here. Oh, we're two more then. One, one and then two. Okay, fine. Yep. Down here, yeah? Yeah. Um, so we haven't mentioned the Arctic Council yet. And I
I'm sorry, you've got to speak up. Oh. The role of the Arctic Council. Yeah, that's a great. Well, we started this effort on called Arctic 21, just before the United States took over as chairmanship in the last two years of the Obama administration. And we, I had worked with the State Department. I knew they needed an agenda. We went in my little group of colleagues, and said you ought to make climate change a focus of the U.S. chairmanship. And they agreed. John Kerry, Secretary of State, easy sell. President, easy sell. Is a science advisor, easy sell. So that helped create a lot more visibility for the Arctic and climate change in and of itself, that decision. President Obama you know, then made a decision to go to Anchorage and the Arctic in order to communicate. He wanted to go there anyway, but... It was he wanted to communicate the issue. So the United States actually did something with its chairmanship. There were some other things, but we did. We said this is important. It's happening, and the, pre the president actually used his communication ability to go up there. No other president has done that. Now the United States. It's a really interesting geopolitics here. Who are the two biggest members of the Arctic Council? United States and Putin, Russia. Okay. Well, what do the Russians think about? They're a big Arctic country. Half their country is permafrost, which has now begun to collapse. Well, very interesting issue. How are they ultimately going to respond to this? They think, oh, we're making out like bandits. We're sailing across the northern route, you know, and we charge everybody a lot of money. But their landscape, their rivers and everything else, is in the process of being transformed. So, okay, who is the new global power in the context of the Arctic Council? Yeah. That's a quiz for all of you. <clears throat> Who's the new global power? With the big platform, Iceland. Uh, ah. Surprise, Iceland? Who ever heard of Iceland as a superpower? Well, I try, that's what I told the, the guy who was an Icelandic negotiator yesterday. Iceland takes over the chairmanship of the Arctic Council from Finland in May. And Iceland, if it decided to do, could do this massive global convening. Everybody wants to go to Iceland, right? But Iceland's glaciers are disappearing. They have their own teaching, their own uh, available school. So the Arctic Council is really a platform for education. As a negotiating entity, that goes on in the climate field. But in terms of bringing the crisis of the Arctic forward, you would think they would do it, and I would argue they've done a lousy job. And Finland, because now it's paralyzed, because Trump is in power. You want to get a document signed? The Trump administration has to sign off. They just had a ministerial in Finland, okay, Arctic Environment Minister's meeting. The National Security Council guy was sent the, the, the chairman's statement done by the Finnish minister. You don't want to hear all this. But this measly statement, with no meaning, ended up being almost vetoed by our National Security Council because it mentioned, mentioned methane and black carbon. So much so that the guy in the National Security Council was doing this, ended up in a conversation with the Finnish ambassador to the United Nations, to the United States, and the president of Finland, trying to get this statement out. That's how disruptive we were. God. Pathetic. Sorry. You don't want to hear all this, but the Arctic Council has plenty of potential. I think of Iceland as the world's next superpower and hope for the best. So we're going to finish off one last question over there, and then we'll wind up. Yeah. They, they disrupt European air travel. Yeah. Cut carbon emissions that way. The question is, um, currently, BP and ExxonMobil are taking full-page advertisements in our national press here, telling us how they are developing new fuels from algal sources. Yeah.
Right. Right. Considering that the global aviation fleet is huge and growing, is this going to be a help if they can source a different? Well, let me turn that question to Hugh. What do you think? Al uh, uh, they're going to derive liquid fuels from algae, right? Yes. Well, then they presumably simply keep, it's like a closed cycle. You develop the fuel, but you keep growing the algae, so you pull the carbon emitted by the fuel mm. out of the atmosphere, right? Well, That's my, the idea? Well, my, my, my friend uh, Duncan McLaren, who you may know, he um, is... He would say straight away, well, if you've got this great way of, of uh, sucking the, uh, the CO2 into the algae, uh, get, get, getting, getting a fuel from your algae, um, let's pump that fuel. Well, why, let's, let's, let's now offer, the first step is, let's offer that fuel to the people in the third world who most need it. What gives us the right to have first bite of that lovely cherry so that we can put it into our planes? Why don't we give it to people in sub-Saharan Africa who need it to, to survive and so that their children don't die because they haven't got enough fuel? Second thing is, let's sequester it. So let's use this as a carbon capture technique and stop flying. So that's, that's the, the argument would be, yes, we can use this as a ni nice, neat way to keep flying. Alternatively, let's say let's, um, we've got to get this CO2 out of the atmosphere and keep it out of the atmosphere. Let's not reburn it because here is this perfect opportunity. We've sucked it out. Let's keep it out. So um, it's an interesting question about if, if we come up with technologies to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere and thereby make this beautiful new fuel, is it our responsibility perhaps not to burn it? Well, all I'd say is you have to live within a certain budget yeah. of carbon emissions, and it's all part of that package. What you were saying today about part of that package is that um, you know, maybe reducing consumption of meat is part of that package. I know. We're going to dinner. I will not eat a steak, I pledge. The, the place we're going to has yeah. got a very good selection of uh, vegetarian and vegan uh, food. Well, we'll go celebrate there with vegetarian food. And they also have... The, the other and we thing, won't fly there either. The other thing is that they also have beer yeah. that is brewed locally. So it's, you know... No, lower, lower carbon footprint. I'm, I'm going gonna, gonna to wind this up and just um, say a couple of things. Firstly, Cambridge Climate Lecture Series uh, is, is a locally run uh, thing. Um, Nick Breeze, who's waving his hand in the air, is part of the committee. Heather behind is part of the committee. Uh, Sophie, is she still here? Is there part of the committee? Uh, Amelia behind is part of the committee. Who else have I missed out on? Um, so if uh, you want to find out more, they're all there. Um, our main events will start up in, um, in February, but I think there will be a couple of other ones during the next uh, few weeks. Uh, go on to the uh, uh, CCLS Facebook page or the website um, uh, Climate Series I think is our um, is where our Twitter is ClimateSeries.com is our website um, We're trying to have good conversations about climate change and I think Rafe, you're a great fun person to have conversations with on, on this Pleasure. You um, you have a, you're very American about this. <laughs> and it's very, and I'm proud of it. And you're proud of it. It's very refreshing. Despite what we've got, yeah. But despite what you've got. Thank you, Ray, very much uh, for a fantastic Thank conversation. Thank you. So I think the plan is, have another glass of 